trust in Well, you can tell by the shirt, and yes, I had five people ask me if I washed this thing. <laughs> yes, I did, uh, this past week for the first time. I wore, it, I wore it three Sundays without washing it, but I thought four is too much. So uh, it's got to last four more weeks. We're going to do eight weeks of I Am. I've said it on several occasions, I'll keep saying it. I am utterly amazed at the simplicity of the gospel of Christ. I think that's why the people who followed him were those who just heard what he said and they believed him and they followed him. They didn't make it complicated. They didn't make it complex. They didn't try to over or under. It just is. Jesus said, I am. Three letters, two words that changed my life changed your life, changed the earth. Three letters, two words, I am. 
In fact, uh, two weeks ago, I, I made this statement and really hadn't planned on it. It just kind of came to me. The answer to every question you will ever ask in your lifetime, in anyone's lifetime, will be answered with three letters, two words. In fact, I want to test you on this. I want you to imagine the most outlandish question amazing question you can ever ima imagine asking Jesus. You walk up to Jesus and say to him your question, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. And I want to tell you right now, he can answer it with three letters, two words. Whatever it is, come up with it. And you ask it and he looks at you and he says, I am. Because he is. He's the answer to every question. He is everything. He is not something. He is everything. Everything. For eight weeks, we deal with I am. Week one was the foundation of the other seven of Jesus' announcements of his identity and purpose. And, and on this shirt, and by the way, my theme next week at Camp Calvary is I am. In fact, this whole idea began with something I was working on for camp. And uh, God just kept working on me, and I just finally relented and thought, well, I'll write one sermon on it, and it turned into eight sermons that I've been working on. And At the very bottom of the I am is the basis that we begin all the others with, and is Jesus' proclamation of his name. Inside the letters of this shirt, which is really what made it so neat, is inside the the three letters, the two words, are all seven of Jesus' Gospel of John announcements of his identity. All seven of them are found inside the letters. But it all begins with this foundation. Jesus comes and he reveals in the Gospel of John to the Jewish people and to the world his name. Now, they're not going to like it because they're not going to believe him. Here we go. John eight fifty six. Your father Abraham rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. Now, now pause a minute. He's talking about Abraham as if he's speaking in the first person. Him and Abraham knew each other. Abraham predates Jesus some 2,000 years. And he says this, your father Abraham rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. He saw it and was glad. The people said, you aren't even 50 years old. How can you say you have seen Abraham? Jesus answered, here he goes, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was even born, I am. I told you it's the answer to every question that will ever be asked. I am. How can you say that you know Abraham? How can you say you've seen Abraham, had a conversation with Abraham? You're not even 50 years old. That's 2,000 years ago. I am. He is or he isn't. Now, how there's a response in verse 59. At that point, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus was hidden from them and left the temple. You can't be who you say you are. Or are you? Is Jesus, I am. Is he who he says he is? In fact, our eternity will be determined by this statement. Is Jesus who he says he is? Do I believe him? They picked up stones to throw at him because he merely told them his name. I am. If Jesus is who he says he is, once you come to that conclusion, if you're in the room today, and let's be honest, I have a feeling there's quite a few in this category. It's okay. It's all right. If you're one of those people that are struggling with the follow me part of Christianity, if you're one of those people that's struggling with the idea of bowing down to this person named Jesus, if you're struggling with follow me, bowing down, yielding your life and your allegiance to this man, there's only one reason. You don't know who he is. The moment you come to the conclusion that he is, I am. He is the answer to every question that will ever be asked in the universe. Following Him will no longer be a burden. Following Him will be the opportunity of a lifetime. In fact, it is a lifetime. Once you get to know who He is, the follow me part of follow me, once you know who the me is, it changes everything. In the Gospel of John, Jesus announces not just His name in John chapter 8, but he goes on, recorded by the Apostle John, 
He makes seven specific I am statements, proclamations of his identity. The first one we did in week two was his announcement that I am the bread of life. He said it in this context, your forefathers, they ate manna in the wilderness and they all dropped dead. But whoever feeds on me, whoever eats of me will live forever. Somebody grab a rock. You can't be that. I am. And then we go to the next one. He makes this proclamation. I am the light of the world. I am the illumination of planet earth. Who do you think you are, Jesus? You think you're the creator? I am. You see, you're going to either believe him or reject him. There's no middle ground on this. And then today, he says, I am the gate. I am the gate. It's found in John chapter 10. By the way, I'm going through these seven announcements of his identity in the I am's in, and as they are listed in the gospel of John in the order in which he announces them. John 10 verse 1. I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant, so he explained it to them. Here we go. I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come after me, all who came before me, excuse me, were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me, listen church, I am the gate. Those who come in through me me will be saved they will come and go freely and will find good pasture the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life i am the gate i went and i looked up different greek and english translations of this word gate and i I found a, a translation of a word, the door. I am the door. I am the entrance. I am the portal. All have the same meaning in our language. You got to go through me to get there, to get somewhere. Today, we specifically look at the I am announcement that he and he alone is the gate through which any of us sheep will ever find good pasture. I don't know what you're looking for in life, but I can assure you, if you could melt it down, you're looking for good pasture. You're looking for some place to go in which your life will be good. Nobody's looking for a place to go to where your life will be bad. You want some good pasture. The question is, through which gate will I go and find that good pasture? Jesus says in this text John chapter 10 it's me you'll have to go through me in fact he says this those who come in through me will be saved it's not complicated well the obvious opposite of that is those who try to come in without him or without going through him will not be saved chapter 10 begins with a statement the I am in chapter 10 does something that he does 78 times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He makes this statement, I tell you the truth. 78 different times he says, I tell you the truth. 78 times it's recorded in the Gospels. I tell you the truth. When the I am does that, 
when he makes that statement, I'll tell you the truth, it usually means there's a lie hanging around somewhere close. And the reason he says, I tell you the truth, is he looks into the audience, he looks into the culture, and there's a lie hanging around close, so I'm going to tell you the truth. What happens to darkness when light comes? Light, darkness has to leave. So he says, I tell you the truth, it's like I'm going to turn on the light. This is no exception. When he says, I tell you the truth, John 10, 1, I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of the sheepfold, I tell you the truth, there's a lie somewhere, anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold, rather than going through the gate, must surely be a thief and a robber. The I am is not only acknowledging the existence of a gate, singular, I want you to catch something here. In this statement, I tell you the truth, the I am is not only acknowledging the existence of a singular gate, one gate, one way, he is also acknowledging the existence of a thief and a robber that tells you you don't need a gate, or maybe there's more than one gate. But he calls him what he is, he's a thief and he's a robber. He's a gate-jumping thief, robbing liar. Can you sneak over this wall that separates us from good pasture? Perhaps there are people in the audience that day that thought maybe you could. Anyone who sneaks, can you sneak over the wall? Do people really think you can sneak over the wall and find some good pasture? Jesus says, I'm the gate, me. There is a wall, there is a gate, there is an entrance, but it's me. Do you think you can sneak over him? Go around him? Still find good pasture? Well, that's not very easy, sneaking over the wall. But you know what? I, I live in a culture, and you live in a culture, that though they would never say it out loud, they would probably say, well, you know, there's more than one way. Why not just go through the gate instead of sneaking over the wall? Well, let me ask a practical question. The I am has stood in front of the world and proclaimed, I am, that's my name, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. And if he's announced that and you believe in him, then why not just go through the gate? Why try to find another way? Why try to go up and around or over or under? Why don't you just go through the gate? Why would anybody just not go through the gate? He says he's the gate. Come on, Terry, that's pretty narrow-minded and insensitive to say that we need a gate, right? Why do I need a gate to find good pasture? Can't I on my own enlightenment find green grass? It's pretty arrogant to say that there's only one gate. That's the world we live in today. Let's be honest. Don't you think it's arrogant, you Christians, to say there's only one gate, one entrance, one portal, one door? What do you mean? That's arrogant. Who are you to tell me that there's only one way? Let me tell you the truth, just from my personal perspective. Before I met the I Am, I didn't even know there was a gate. Until I encountered the I Am and knew His name, and He started revealing that I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am a gate. Until I met Him, I didn't even know there was a gate. I had no clue. Until I met the I Am, I wasn't even looking for a gate, much less listening to the voice of the gatekeeper. You see, the truth is this, there is only one man that has ever been able to walk through that gate into green pasture. There is only one man, listen church, there is only one man that has ever, ever been able to walk through that gate into green pasture. And he is the one who said, John 8, 58, I'll tell you the truth, before Abraham was even born, I am. The I am did what no other man since Adam has ever been able to do. If you miss this, you're going to miss the whole concept of the gate. The I am, what Jesus is announcing in this scene, John chapter 10, is this. I was able to do what no other person since Adam has ever been able to do. And there was a lot of people between Adam and Jesus, but no one's ever been able to do. Walk through the gate into God's presence. So some of you might think, what do you mean by that? What gate? 
What was it that separated us from God's presence? And why weren't there any people between Adam and Jesus able to walk through the gate into the presence of God? That gate went up in the time of Adam. Let me read it to you. It's found in Genesis 3.22. In Genesis 3, by the time we get to the verse 22, sin has come into the world. Look at, look at the context. Then the Lord God said, Look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out, take fruit from the tree of life, and eat it? Then they will live forever. So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden. What's the Garden of Eden symbolize, really? Not just symbolic, I mean, the reality of it, what? It is abiding in the presence of God. The Bible says Adam walked with God in the cool of the day, and now suddenly an event has occurred in which I have to read, so the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden, and he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. After sending them, Adam and Eve, out, the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim. If you're wondering what cherubim are, their angels. The Lord God stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the, don't miss it, the tree of life. It's in the garden, and now they're out of the garden, and between them and the tree is a gate. There didn't used to be a gate, and now there's a gate. And you can't go in. Not only is the tree of life on the other side of the gate, the, the abiding presence of God that Adam once enjoyed now is also behind the gate. Never again will Adam be able to have a relationship with God like he was before sin. Sin put up a gate. So when I sit here today and I say to you, no other man since Adam has ever been able to walk through that gate into the presence of God except this man who says he is the I am. I am the gate. Do you think anyone ever climbed over that gate? God has stationed at the east side of the Garden of Eden a gate, the flaming swords by angels. And I can imagine they were pretty powerful angels and they've got flaming swords do you think anybody you think adam looks at eve and says i think we can get through there do you think anybody went over or around or under that gate into the presence of god and find access to the tree of life and eat of the tree of life and live forever or is that gate because of who built it impenetrable hold that scene in your mind and then here comes Jesus and says I am the game it's me no one since the time of Adam has ever been able to penetrate the gate of God's presence to walk without sin into the presence of God himself but I am sin put up a gate between man and God Today, I'm going to tell you, you can deny it, you can laugh about it, you can make jokes about it if you want to, and it won't change anything. It's still the truth. Sin put up a gate between God and man. You can't climb over it, you can't go around it. Regardless of what the thief and the robber wants to tell you about the gate, no one's getting in except through it. There was one man that didn't have any sin. Adam held that title for a very short time, and then he lost that title. There was a man, Adam, that didn't have sin, and then he had sin, and the gate went up. But there has since then been one man to follow Adam. The Bible refers to him as the second Adam, and this Adam has zero sin, zero sin. One man. He didn't have any sin, and he walked through the gate and listen, church, don't miss this. He walked through the gate, and thus his perfection and his obedience to the Father, he became the gate. He didn't just walk through the gate into the presence of God. Now picture him in the Garden of Gethsemane. We're looking at the Garden of Eden, now to the Garden of Gethsemane. And in his obedience to the Father, when he said, nevertheless, not my will but yours be done, he is entering the presence of God through obedience. Perfect 
obedience his entire life. He walks through the gate, he becomes the gate, and then he does something. The most amazing thing in all of human history is what he does next. He walks through the gate with perfection. He becomes the gate because of his own righteousness. And he turns to the world and says two words, follow me. I am. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate into the presence of the Father. I did it. Nobody else did. Adam didn't do it. I'm the second Adam. I did it. I walked through. I became the gate, and I turned and said, anybody want to go in? Follow me. John 10, verse 1. Let me read it again. I tell you the truth, Jesus says. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But notice what he says next, but the one. There's only one. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come in, come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them. The, the whole concept of follow me. After he has gathered his flock, he walks ahead of them. And what's he going to do? Look what he says next. And they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They'll run from a stranger because they don't know his voice. The one who entered through the gate to pay the price for the sins of all mankind was the I Am. His name is Jesus. He entered through the gate and thus became the gate. You're not going to go around or over the gate. That gate kept Adam and Eve from eating from the tree of life and living forever. It is recorded in the Genesis account that that gate, that separated Adam from the tree, Adam from the very presence of God, kept Adam from eating something that would make him live forever, the tree of life. The tree of life was behind the gate. He couldn't get in. And thus, guess what happened to Adam? Adam died. Now, I want to do something. I want you to listen to what the I Am has said about that gate. This is my favorite part today. I, we've spent time looking at the gate that separated man from God, man from the tree of life in the time of Adam. Jesus is the only one who became the gate, was perfect, entered through the gate, became the gate, said, follow me. And then he does this. The I Am looks into the future. It's called the book of Revelation. He announces that the tree of life is back. But it's also on the other side of the gate. Just like in Genesis, there's a tree of life, but I can't get to it because there's a gate and there's angels and fiery swords. But this time, Revelation 22, these are the words of the I Am. Verse 12, look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. I am, here he goes, I am the Alpha. I am the Omega. I'm the first letter of the alphabet. I'm the last letter of the alphabet. I am the beginning. I am the end. Anybody going to grab a rock saying you can't be all of that? But he is. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes. This is revelation. Listen to what he says. Blessed are those who wash their robes. They will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit of, from the tree of life. There it is. I wonder how you get your robe washed to get in that gate. Blessed. Blessed are the ones. That means unblessed are the ones who don't get their robes white. So how do I get my robe white? Because my robe white will get me through the gate, and once I get through the gate, there is something that has eluded man since the time of Adam. It's called the tree of life. And the tree of life, if you eat of it, you will live forever. Jesus says, coming soon. 
It's like a commercial coming soon. An upcoming event. If it was soon in the time of the Apostle John, how soon would it be today? If you answer anything but imminent, you'd be a scoffer. He says, and I read it, it says, Look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me. If it was soon in that day, surely it's soon today. Bringing the reward to the gate people. You ever thought of yourself, there's a lot of titles people give church people or followers of Jesus, but I want to tell you today, we're the gate people. We're the followers of the gate. He says, I'm going to bring a reward for the gate people, those who didn't think they could climb over the gate, but they decided to bow down to the gate and follow him through. Blessed are those who wash their robes in the blood of the gate. A few moments ago, we sang that song. Just It moves my heart. Nothing but the blood. You know what's going to make that white robe white? It's kind of this paradox. How can you get a white robe white with red blood? Though your sins be as scarlet, he will make them as white as snow. Unless that blood of this gate is on your robe you won't go through that gate I am every question you'll ever answer ask all has the same answer I am I am blessed verse 14 blessed are those who wash their robes they will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit from the tree of life. Verse 15, outside the city are the dogs. There's something on the other side of that wonderful gate. On this side of the gate is the outside and there are dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idol worshipers, and all who love to live a lie. Love to live a lie. He's the only one that can get those stains out of your life and make you white. So what's on the other side of the gate that's the tree of life? Let me read verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes. They will be permitted with washed robes, washed in the blood of the Lamb. They will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit from the tree of life. So what's over there? Well, let's, let's summarize some of the things. God's over there. The Father, the Son, is over there. Light is over there. The tree of life is over there. If, if there was nothing else on the other side, I want to go. If that's all I know about what's on the other side of the gate, and Jesus says, I am the gate, and to go through the gate, you got to go through me. I want to go. Because the contrast of all of those events is all I need to know. If all of that's on the other side of the wall, on the other side of the gate, then that means on this side of the gate is what? It's not God. And it's not the sun. And there is no light, which means there's only darkness. And there is no tree of life, which means there's only death. And before I go any further with the word death, I'm going to define the word death in biblical terms. The word death in biblical terms is not fade to black unconscious, non-functioning reality. It is existence forever in the absence of God. That's what it'll be like on the outside. When you could have been on the inside, the I am is on the other side of the gate and also the tree of life, forever life in the presence of the I am. But in case you're wondering, not everyone will go through this gate because they have refused to believe in the I am. I've noticed something personal. I want to share something personal. I, I do a lot of funerals. I've done a lot of funerals over the last 20 years and I can't even imagine how many funeral services I've done, but I've noticed something over the last months that somewhat's telling to me. Two things, and maybe it has something to do with what I say at funerals. Maybe it does. 
But two things I have noticed that I have said over and over at most funerals, two th specific things, and I've noticed that they bring about some sense of aggravation in the audience. And uh, On several occasions, it's been a, a physical aggravation. I've had people do everything but shout at me when I said that what I'm about to tell you. The first is this. I will say usually in almost every funeral service, not everyone goes to heaven. Jesus himself says only a few. And I guess everybody assembled in the funeral would like for me to tell them that everyone goes to heaven, but then I'd be a liar. Because Jesus is the one who is the gate, and he is the I am, and he is the bread of life and the light of the world, and he said only a few. So if he said only a few, I'm going to go with what he said. But you know, every funeral I've ever been to, and you've heard me say it before, what I always hear is the same thing. You know, he was a good man. He's in a better place. And if I listen to the doctrine of the funeral home, then everybody goes to heaven and everybody's in a better place and everybody was good enough to go through the gate. And then I read the words of the I am. And he says, no, they're not. No, they're not. There's no good enough. Nobody's ever been good enough to go to heaven. Nobody. You, you go to heaven by having your robe washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's a whole different category. So when I say those words out loud, not everyone goes to heaven, people start to get agitated, and I watch their facial expressions, and sometimes I wonder, will I be the first preacher at a funeral home that gets something thrown at? I've seen people really mad, like really mad when I say that. And, and the second thing is this, when I, I make this statement, not just about not everybody goes to heaven, but I make this statement that sin is the cause of all death. In fact, I remember this one funeral, it's been quite a while ago, that I said that the cause of death is sin, and the death in this room today is because of sin. People took offense to that, as if somehow or another that's not true. Well, it's not that they maybe don't think it's true, they don't think it's applicable to today. It's applicable to every day. Sin has always been the cause of death. So I bring those two points up to illustrate this. Not everyone's going to go through the gate. Sin, unless it is dealt with, will keep you outside the gate. It has to be dealt with. That's why the robe becomes white, is that the blood of the sin turns it white as snow. The blood of the forgiveness of sin, the blood of Christ. Revelation 22, 15. Out the, outside the city gates are dogs, the sorcerers the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idol worshipers. And here's the point. And all who love to live a lie. What lie? Everybody goes to heaven. Sin's not the cause of death. That lie. They didn't really believe the truth. So if you don't believe the truth, then you believe the lie. Which means you've gone to funerals of people who are going to hell. You've gone to, you know people, you've gone to their funerals, people who are not going to go in the gate. But nobody wants to say it out loud. So people want to live the lie. Don't tell me that. Well, I don't know. I don't know this one's gone to heaven. This one got through the gate. This one didn't make it. I don't know. But I know this. Everybody's not going to heaven. Only a few. And outside will be what? The sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idol worshipers. And don't focus so much on the individual sins because they all have something in common. They're part of the lie. Is this sin's not a problem? What lie? Everyone goes to heaven. Or maybe there's another lie. The other lie, and I've seen this go both directions, more increasingly more in our Bible Belt that it used to be heaven's a reality. Now there's this, this notion that there's no afterlife at all. It's just kind of a fade to black, unconscious, non-existent state. That's a lie. And there's another lie. God wouldn't send anyone to hell. Nobody. God's a loving, merciful God that wouldn't refuse anyone entry to the gate. Or maybe there's another lie, and that's that there's a mini gate. You know what? That Muslim thing over there in the Far East, I don't understand it. That Muhammad thing. You know what? They worship the God of Abraham. We worship the God of Abraham. We're really just worshiping the same guy, right? Wrong. No, we're not. No, we're not. No, we're not. We will never be worshiping the same God. 
So, you know what they're really saying is that there's more than one gate. And Jesus says there's only one gate. Hey, I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you are the Savior of the world. But I just think you're wrong about the gate thing. I think there's a bunch of gates. You know, the Buddhists, they're really nice people. They won't even kill a fishing worm. So God's surely not going to keep anybody out of the gate who wouldn't kill a fishing worm. So the Buddhists, they're just another gate. And the Hindus, you know what? They won't eat beef because it's grandma. So really, so God surely wouldn't keep anybody out of heaven for not eating cow meat because it might be grandma. So that's another gate. And you know what? We, we laugh, but you know what? He says that outside of the gate are the sexually immoral, and he gives all this because they love to live a lie. You know why they want to live a lie? Because the truth is way more strict. It's narrow. There's one gate. His name's Jesus. There's just one way. He's the only way. They all... They're all lies based on a simple, a simple premise or question. And here it is. And I'm going to keep going through this for the next four weeks. Is Jesus who he says he is? You're going to answer yes or no to that one day. You might, want, you might not be doing it right now, but you actually are doing it. Is Jesus who he says he is? Is he the bread of life? He says, your forefathers, all those other people, they ate manna in the wilderness and all of them died. But if you eat of me, you will never, ever die. Yes or no? If, if you believe that, it changes everything. And then he says, I'm the light of the world. I am the illumination of the planet Earth. If you believe that, it changes everything. And then he comes and he says, I'm the gate to the tree of life, forever life in the presence of God. Is he or isn't he the I am? Is he telling the truth? In those 78 different verses in the Gospels, is he telling the truth? Is he the second Adam come to open the gate that the first Adam closed? Is he? I believe he is. Is he the second Adam that came to open the gate that the first Adam closed? Yes. You and I and all mankind will eventually come to one or two conclusions regarding Jesus. He is telling the truth, or he's a liar. If he is a liar, don't worry about anything I've said today. Go home. Why not? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. If he is a liar, don't worry about the bread of life, the light of the world, the gate to heaven stuff. Don't worry about it. It's meaningless, right? If he's a liar, then it's all a lie. But if he's telling the truth, church, listen to me. If he's telling the truth, he is the I am. He is the I am, and he has had recorded in a book we call the Bible for all of us to read what he said. And what did he say? I'll tell you the truth. Before Abraham was even born, I am. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. So how do I keep from being deceived? The Bible, in this, check, in this context of John chapter 10, he talks about deception, people not hearing the right voice and following the wrong shepherd. So how do I keep from being deceived? Really, how does it happen? This gate-jumping liar named Satan has deceived the best of them. L look around, folks. I can, I can name a bunch. This gate-jumping liar has deceived the very best of the best. In fact, let's just be honest. He got everybody but Jesus. To some degree, he got everybody but Jesus deceived in some way, shape, or fashion. So how can I keep from being deceived? Is it even possible? Several months ago, I came under such major conviction about a certain prayer. It began with just this calling of the Holy Spirit in my life to totally rad radically change my prayer life. I had to start spending way more of my life praying, and I have been spending way more of my life praying. But it was more than that. It became quite specific. It's been months ago that this started to work in my life through my own prayer life and through the study of the Word. I began praying that prayer for myself, for my family, and for the church. In fact, I remember months back, I came to the church. Some of you will remember. 
I came to the church and I passionately told you what God had put on my heart that I personally was going to have to start praying for me, that I was going to be praying for my house, and I was going to be praying for the body of Christ at Nineveh. I told you. And that would have been enough to keep me doing that until the day I look into his face. But there was something more. On the first week of May, most of you hopefully remember and you participated, we did 72 hours of reading the Word. We started on a Sunday night at 8 o'clock and read for some 72 hours until we got to the end of Revelation. What a wonderful experience. We've done two years in a row here. So I opened up that night as I did the previous year, and I began at 8 o'clock on Sunday night, and I started reading Genesis 1-1. I wanted to read again during that, but I wanted to make sure everybody had a time to do it. So once all the slots kind of get filled up, I went to Will. He was kind of keeper of the, of the register, who's going to read when. And I said, give me a slot. I don't care. Just give me a slot. I just want to read again. So he gave me a 10 o'clock Wednesday morning time slot. I believe that was right. And Chad was reading that morning, and Will was reading that morning. I think Scott, the staff, was going to be reading during the day that day as we finished up that night. I didn't think much about it except, you know, I was looking forward to that time. I really loved to do that. So I came in here and I opened it up. Where are you? I, I couldn't possibly pick where you'd be at that time. Who knows where you'll be after that many hours. But when I came up and I relieved the person before me, I was in the Gospel of Luke. Still didn't think anything about it. Started reading from the Gospel of Luke. And then... I hit this verse. I just about couldn't continue. I thought, you're going to fall apart up here, and all you got to do is read for 30 minutes. And I just about couldn't even speak, couldn't even get the words come out of my mouth. Because the same passage that God had impressed upon me about three or four months earlier was the exact same passage that I ended up reading. I want to read it to you. And I'm reading it to you for this reason. There's a gate-jumping liar out there who is good at it. He has gotten the best of the best. So how am I going to keep from being deceived by the gate-jumping liar? Here it is. I'm going to give it to you. What you do with it's your call. I can tell you what I'm going to do with it. I'm going to use it. That Wednesday morning when I started reading from the Gospel of Luke, this is what I read. These are the words of the I Am. Luke 21, 34. Watch out. Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. Don't let that day catch you unaware like a trap. For that day will come upon everyone living on the earth. Keep alert at all times. And here we go. And pray that you might be strong enough to escape the coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. So you know what I started doing? I pray every day. I prayed before I came down here this morning from the office area. I'm on my knees and I pray, Lord, I pray that I'd be strong enough to escape the coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. I fear the deception of Satan so much that I ask God that he relieve me from being able to be deceived. I don't think you can fake out the I am. So I'm going to pray. And then I got to the second part, and the second part is in Luke 22, just a few verses down. It says this, Then, accompanied by the disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room, went out as usual to the Mount of Olives. What's taking place? The crucifixion is about to take place. This is a, the last events before the cross. Then he told his disciples. What would he tell his disciples that would be so important before the cross? Pray that you will not give in to temptation. Do you think that's just some spiritual counsel, or is he being specific that I should begin praying that I would not fall into temptation? One more time, Luke twenty two forty five. At last he stood up again and returned to the disciples, only to find them asleep, exhausted from grief. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. Are you listening? I'm asking you. I'm warning you. There's a gate-jumping liar that deceives. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy, and he's really quite good at it. And Jesus' response to those gate followers 
Pray. Pray that you'd be strong enough to escape the coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. Pray that you will not give in or fall into temptation. Will temptations come? Oh, they're going to come. But pray that you will not yield to those temptations by the power of the I Am who lives in me. Are you listening? Are you praying? So let me ask you one question. Do you know his voice? When he speaks, would you recognize him? Because there's another voice that speaks. Would you know his voice? Would you recognize his voice if he spoke to you? Let me read John 10, 3. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. The sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name. Who are the sheep? The sheep are us. He, the I am, calls his own sheep by name, and then he leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his what? Voice. Do you? You know, this is really going to be important. They follow him because they know his voice. Verse 5, they won't follow a stranger. They'll run from him because they don't know his voice. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant, so he explained it to them. I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep, the true sheep, did not listen to the thieves and the robbers. Why? 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 He said it. Why? Because they know the voice of the shepherd. They know what the gate sounds like. Do you? In Hebrews chapter 1, it begins with a remarkable event of one of the differences between the church age New Testament and the Old Testament. Here it is. Listen. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. Read the Old Testament. How many different ways did God speak to his people? There's burning bushes. There's angelic encounters. There's sound from the clouds. There's lots of different ways, right? In the Old Testament, I, you know, just the prophets who get the word of God and go reveal it to people. In the, look what it says. In the long ago, God spoke many times in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. But now Jesus has come. Something's going to be different. But now, and now, in these final days, final days, the countdown, tick, 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 tick. In these last days, in these final days, how's he going to talk? He has spoken to us through his Son. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance, and through the Son, He created the universe. I am. In the last days, who speaks? Jesus. Do you know His voice? Can you imagine the I am calling you by name? Jerry, James, what are you going to do when you hear his name? He says, my sheep know my voice and I call them by name. So my question is to each one of you, when the I am calls your name, will you know his voice and what are you going to do? What? Is, is that, Huh? What's the appropriate response when the I am calls your name? My sheep know my voice, and I call them by name. My sheep. Those are the ones who are going to go in through the gate. What would you do with that call? Would you recognize his voice? The sheep know the voice of the master, and the sheep know the voice of the stranger. Do you know his voice? Would you recognize it if you heard it? Really, I'm asking. Really, practical question. Some of you right now, you're thinking, well, I can only picture what you're saying as some thunderous voice from the clouds, and I hope so. But do you know his voice? Really? I think one of the greatest examples of this answer to this question would be the story of Elijah and God at the mountain. Let me give you a brief context. Elijah 
has been called by God to do this incredible thing. He prayed and it stopped raining and drought came. And finally there's this showdown on Mount Carmel and he kills the 450 prophets of Baal. And rain starts to come. It's like the highlight of all Old Testament history. And, and, and Elijah, he's wore out. He's, he's exhausted. God says, come, I want you to, he's frustrated. He's frustrated. Jezebel's coming to kill him. He's running for his life. And God says, I want you, I'm summoning you to the mountain of God. Come, i got something to tell you. So Elijah, already exhausted, travels by foot to the mountain of God where he will encounter the I Am. Listen, church. He will encounter the I Am. So how will the I Am communicate to this man named Elijah? His prophet. Now, I'm going to cut to the end. This guy is so incredible, this Elijah guy. He didn't even taste death. God comes and gets him. He never dies. Sends a chariot of fire to deliver him. So before all that, he's now called to the mountain of God. How will he encounter the voice of God? What will it look like? What will it sound like? Because when I see that, it has application. What, what would the voice of the I am look like to me? What would it sound like to me? How do I know his voice and the voice of the gate jumping liar? 1 Kings 19. God said to Elijah, go out and stand before me on the mountain. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. Uh oh Do you know what just happened? God just went by Elijah. The I Am, the creator of everything that is, just, just went by Elijah. You think this was a small event? Let him go by your house. And the Lord went by Elijah. And a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. And the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard the whisper, he wrapped his faith, face in his cloak, went out and stood at the entrance of the cave, and a voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Why did he whisper? He can be an earthquake. He can be the wind. He can be the fire. He can make the rocks fall off the mountain. And in this context, he chose to whisper. Well, are you listening? He's a whisper. He was not in the wind. So I'm going to ask you, church, this question. Have you been listening for him in the wind? You're waiting for something big to happen. Maybe you're thinking you're going to get one of those moments where he speaks in a loud voice from the clouds. Is that what you're waiting on? He was not in the earthquake. Have you been looking for him in the earthquake, some cataclysmic event? And Then, Lord, I'll get it. When you show me some cataclysmic, world-shaking event, then, yeah, I'll hear your voice. I'll understand then. Yeah, give me an earthquake. Give me the wind. Give me some fire. So here's the question. Would you hear him in a gentle whisper? I wonder this past week, has he been whispering to a bunch of people? And quite frankly, the reason you're not hearing him and a lot of people aren't hearing him because there's so much stuff and there's so much noise in your life. But you don't hear anything. In fact, I really want to say that one of the greatest tools of that gate jumping liar right now is noise. TV's always on, radio's on, half the people got something stuck in their ears. And I'm waiting to hear the voice of God. Really? If he's whispering, you'll never hear him. You'll never hear him. Why? Sometimes you know the scripture says, be still and know that I'm the Lord. Sometimes you just got to put everything out of your life, all the stuff, all the busyness, all the noise, and just get away. Just get away. Get away. Too much noise, too many distractions, too much stuff. 
I can tell you just from my own personal experience, I hear him, that gentle voice, every time I open the Word. I don't open the Word with the radio on. I don't open the Word in front of the television. I don't open the Word in a big crowd of people. I open the Word and I read the book when there's nobody around. If I'm in the office, I shut the door. Why? I want to hear him. I want to recognize his voice. And you know what? I can. I don't hear something coming through the roof or through the walls. I hear it coming through his word. Sometimes it's just a whisper. So, so the times when you go to pray, you pray, Lord, I pray that I would not fall into temptation. Am I going to pray that somewhere in a crowd of people? Or do I need to be praying that somewhere where it's just me and him? Why does he tell me to go off into my closet? Shut the door. Turn off the noise. Pray that you will not fall into temptation. Pray that you'd be strong enough to escape the coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. When are you going to do that? When it's just me and him. Because I want to hear what he's going to say. I want to know. How does he do it? I don't know how he does it. But I believe he is whispering. He's telling me. He's putting into my heart his words. I hear him every time I pray, every time I read his word, every time I bow down to him in submission of my life, surrender of my life to his purpose and will. I hear him asking me to follow the I am through the gate and take hold of the tree of life. Follow me. Come on through the gate, Terry. I want you to come in and take hold of the tree of life. I hear him asking me to tell others about the I am that holds that gate open today. I remember the Apostle Paul as he enters the, the last days of his life and he writes to Timothy. He says this. He says, I consider my life worth nothing if I do not complete the task of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, I got to tell people about the gate. I got to tell somebody about the gate. You know, in my heart, what the whisper is, you got to tell people that right now, today, for a season, for a moment, the gate went through the gate, and he's holding the gate open. And right now, today, the I am, the bread of life, the light of the world, the gate has stepped through in his own righteous perfection into the presence of God, and he's reached his hand back, and he's holding the gate open. But there will come a season when that gate will close. That's what I hear in the whisper. And I hear him say to me, pray that you, Terry, will not fall into temptation. Pray that for your house and pray that for your church because the gate jumping liar will tell you everything but. When you finally understand who the I am is, the follow me part of Christianity will no longer be your problem. When you know who he is, that he is the gate to good pasture. And the tree of life is there. Follow me, bowing to him. <laughs> it's not my problem anymore. I'm past that one because I know who he is. I know where he's gone and where he's going and what he did and what he's going to do. So John 8, 57, we close where we started. The people said, you aren't even 50 years old. How can you say you have seen Abraham? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was even born, I am. At that point, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus was hidden from them and left the temple. I'm going to ask Chad to come on out as I ask one more thing of you. I want you to visualize this before we sing the invitation. If there is a gate, and on the other side of the gate is the tree of life and the light of the world and the presence of God and no more sickness or death or pain or suffering and green pastures and everything you ever imagined, eternal life in the presence of God. If that's on the other side of the gate, what's on this side? Darkness. Weeping. Gnashing of teeth. Anguish. You want to die, but you can't die. 
the greatest nothing. To be able to see the greatest nothing just long enough to know that you'll never have it. To be able to see the greatest thing, the greatest thing is the love of God, just in time to be given the greatest nothing, the absence of God. So here's the question. Who wouldn't go through the gate? Come on. Who wouldn't go through the gate? Unbelievers. Unbelievers. What? If you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, he is the I am. He is the bread of life. He is the light of the world. He is the gate to green pastures, the tree of life. I'll tell you what, if you believe that, you'll go through the gate. You won't think about it. You won't ponder it. You'll let them go through the gate. You know who will be on the outside? Unbelievers. They don't believe it. Because if you believed it, you would take hold of it. Right now, today, the gate is being held open by the I am. But there will be a last day. Through your death, that will be your last day. Or through the coming of Christ, that will be the last day. You better get in through that gate. Jesus says, I am. Stand the invitation. Yeah. 
open the back door. Guys, come on in. In honor of our uh, 4th of July, we have a last closing song. Here we go. God bless America. Everybody sing along. Land that I love stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above from the mountains to the prairies to the ocean wide with foam God bless America my home sweet home God Let me say, your greatest responsibility beside the salvation of your own life is that you will teach these children who is the I Am. And that you will teach them by living out that in your own life. Let's pray together. Father, today in this place we worship the I Am. In this place.